again it has i had disconnected Uh, so your life go ahead hello guys welcome to the maharashtra chapter of indian association of gynecological endoscopist tog webinar and it's today we are going to discuss on 2nd july endometriosis and enigma i am very thankful to our partners academic science integra partners and sun pharma to connect all of us with you carl von rokitansky in 1860 provided the first identification and detailed description of endometriosis he is known as the father of endometriosis endometriosis is a very enigmatic and a very different difficult understanding pathology which we encounter as a gynecologist in our practice and today we have with us a well known international figure of a great stature in the field of endometriosis especially those which we deal in the deep pelvic endometriosis cavity and the rectosigmoid plate so for the first time on our show the tog webinar which is the best and the number one platform today in pan india we have with us dr horace roman dr horace roman is a surgeon of endometriosis and is attached to the endometriosis center of clinic tivoli dukas bordio he is also the honorary professor of rs university hospital Denmark PhD in epidemiology I met him in AGL 2015 and I was enthralled by his videos and the way he approached the endometriosis especially in the deep cul-de-sac and the rectovaginal plate and you will see his mesmerizing surgeries he has done more than 1100 patients with an experience of colorectal endometriosis 250 with urinary bladder endometriosis and 70 with nodules of the sacral plexus mind you these are all very rare localization and he is a pioneer he has more than 200 articles and publications in this field of subject and he has done two randomized trial in colorectal endometriosis so we will be seeing dr horace roman live from france and he is going to show us his magic thank you dr horace for joining with us today Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to introduce and go ahead and introduce our next panelist, and we have none other than Dr. Nandita Palchekar, Madam. She is the professor in obstetrics and gynecology at the D. Y. Patil Medical College, Navi Mumbai. We all know that she had a wonderful time as a Foxy president in 2019. Currently, she is an Amox president. Amox is all Maharashtra Obstetric and Gynecological Society. and she is the director of the bloom ivf which is spread all across india she has been felicitated by many awards especially the mayor award of mumbai the bharat gaurav awards and she was also the past president of mogs iag vice president of sr 2020 welcome dr nandita palchekar dr bhaskar pal we all know him as a great orator and a man with perfect diagnosis and super oratory skills we know he is that he is very firm he is very prompt and he will go ahead and disc point and being heard so i welcome dr baskar pal who is the foxy vice president and also the senior consultant at the polo green eagles hospital kolkata he is going to be the president elect or going to be taking shortly 
the presidential post of Bengal Obstetric and Gynecology. Welcome, Dr. Baskar. And we have from AIMS, the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Dr. Garima Kachwa. She is a professor there. We already have seen her along with Dr. as a joint secretary of Fox 1617, Dr. Dr. Alka Kriplani, madam. Yes, what a wonderful year it was. She's also the secretary of Delhi. For Foxy Korean Award in 2017. She has got Shiyulu Rudra Sina CS Dawn Prize and many more prizes. And we want to discuss with her a latest clinical trial which she has done on Klebergolin, the use in endometriosis. So, with that introduction, I would like to hand over the mic now to Dr. Horace Roman for his presentation which is going to talk today. Dr. Horace on deep endometriosis, deep pelvic endometriosis in the rectosigmoid region. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for uh, this uh, introduction. And uh, it is my pleasure to um, Do you see my folder? my screen yes we can see your image but uh, you will have to press the green button my screen do yes i I press, I press the the screen uh, sharing yeah. the screen then then you will have to go to the current slide on your uh, pptx slideshow current slide from the beginning and it will start Like this? Do you see my first uh, slide? No, sir. We are not seeing it. So, so share the share the screen. Yes, sir. You have to okay. Okay. press the green button. Yes, okay. yes. We, are, we uh, saw it. So nice. Now you can go on the. Yes. Thank you. Okay. We can see. Lovely. So. It is my great pleasure to be involved in your um, in your virtual meeting, and uh, it is my pleasure to speak about my uh, favorite topic, which is the management of uh, deep endometriosis, particularly those involving the rectosigmoid. And I represent uh, our uh, institute, Franco-European Institute of uh, Multidisciplinary Management of Endometriosis. And I also represent the Air Aureus University in Denmark, where uh, it is my pleasure to be honorary professor. So, so you you have to know that I have uh, several uh, disclosure because uh, I uh, am involved in uh, master classes, and uh, I receive personal fees from this. However, it is obvious that. Uh, all the ideas I will defend in my uh, talk, in my uh, talk, or my own ideas, and not those uh, of uh, various uh, industrial partners. So let's start by uh, discussing about the types of rectal sigmoid nodules. So let's discuss about what we are treating when we carried out um, surgery for rectal uh, colorectal endometriosis. So in my opinion, there are two kinds of rectosigmoid nodules. The first one looks like a posterior adenomyoma as it comes outside from the cervix and involves the mid or low or uh, upper rectum. So these nodules are obvious in ultrasound, in MRI. They can be touched through the vaginal uh, route and, um, and uh, they are responsible for various rectal symptoms. And these nodules are very difficult to miss during the laparoscopy because the Douglas pouch is uh, completely closed. These are, I think, they are the most frequent. And then we have a second type of nodules. I call them solitary nodules because they are not in connection 
with the ovaries, the uterosacral ligaments, or the uterus. And uh, they can be missed on MRI or also during the laparoscopy. And uh, as they usually involve the sigmoid colon, there is a huge risk of occlusion in this case. So we have two types of nodule, this one and this one. Another very, very important uh, point is the level of the involvement of the rectal sigmoid. So not all the rectal, colorectal nodule are alike. And uh, their severity increase when they are close to the anus. <clears throat> so we can identify four types of colorectal nodules. Those involving the low rectum, meaning less than five centimeter above the anal verge. Those involving the mid rectum at the level of the cervix between 10 and five centimeter above the anal verge. And then we have the upper rectum and the sigmoid colon. The mean age of patients who undergo a surgery for rectosigmoid endometriosis is around 30, 30 years. And the morbidity of the surgery, which is the major challenge, because when you carry out a surgery, we try to improve the health and not to have complications. So the morbidity increase, increases when the nodules involve the low and the mid rectum. And here is my personal experience, meaning from uh, 2005 until uh, the lockdown in March uh, 2020. Um, and uh, from, from this experience, I pick up one year of uh, experience in uh, Tivoli, uh, Tivoli Center. And during one year, I managed almost 200 colorectal and uh, 200 colorectal endometriosis, 2000, 2060. And as you see, 10% of them involves the low rectum, 30% of them the mid rectum, meaning that 40% of rectosigmoid nodules uh, may be tricky to manage and also they are exposed to a significant postoperative morbidity. Now, Let's have a look at what the surgeon usually do in colorectal endometriosis. And you know that when we manage a colorectal nodule, we can adopt two approaches. A conservative approach, meaning that we'll shave the, the rectum without opening the bowel, or we'll carry out a disc excision, we'll cut around the nodule and we'll leave, we'll conserve the rectum itself. And then we have the radical surgery where we cut a segment of the rectum on the colon. So is the segmental correctorization. And you have to know that uh, historically, the first articles published in 88 to 92 were reported rather laparoscopic conservative management because most, most of, uh, of surgeons were carrying out a shaving and the nodulectomy. And the first colorectal, colorectal uh, resection was done in 90 by uh, uh, David Redwine. And then progressively, once the number of cases increased, uh, guidelines recommended to involve colorectal surgeons to help us to do this surgery. And the colorectal surgeons usually do the segmental colorectal resection then the number of patients with segmental correctors resection considerably increased. Here you have a survey carried out in France in 2015, when I called all my colleagues involved more or less in the management of correct endometriosis, and I asked them how they had managed the, this disease during for one year in 2015. And as you can see, um, this is my center. I was in Rouen at that time with uh, 124 cases a year and until uh, colleagues were doing one or two cases a year. And you can see that there is a huge 
variety, variability between the technique they use. Because in red, you have the shaving. In blue, you have the colorectal resection. And uh, in uh, yellow, you have the disc excision. Meaning that in France in 2015, 92% of cases were managed laparoscopically, and this is a very, very good point. 55% of cases were managed using a conservative procedure, shaving or disc excision. However, there were not rules because several surgeons with similar activity were using either a majority of shaving or a majority of uh, colorectal resections. However, I think that we have, we have to be able to balance our, uh, our different techniques. And this is my experience in 100, uh, 1,060 patients managed until the lockdown. And uh, you can see that the shaving, the disc excision and colorectal resection are, are used or employed in a somehow similar, uh, similar uh, proportion meaning that each time I try to find the, the, the best technique for each patient, meaning that I, I try to, to propose a custom-made uh, treatment or management and not one technique suitable for everybody. And in 60% of cases, I am able to carry out a conservative procedure. <clears throat> now, how the rectosigmoid endometriosis can be managed? So I told you that we have three, three types of surgery. We have the shaving, the disc excision, and the colorectal resection. So shaving, what does it mean? It means that the surgeon will excise the nodule more or less completely, but without opening the bowel or the rectum. To do this, he can use scissors or laser or plasma energy, harmony scalpel, all the instruments, the robots, the goal is to carry out a complete excision or as complete as possible and to conservate the bowel without opening. Each time, particularly when the shaving is done very deep, you have to check that actually the bowel was not, uh, was not open because after a shaving, the fistula are always catastrophic after a shaving, if you have a fistula, very rare fistula, they are all, always due to uh, a necrosis of the bowel and uh, the consequences are catastrophic. But the big advantage of the, of the shaving is that, is that in a majority of cases, the bowel is not open and this will decrease the risk of complications. The disadvantage of the shaving is that in numerous cases, the resection of the microscopic lesions, but also of some fibrous microscopic lesions is not complete. Conversely, the advantage is that the rate of complication is very low. Also, if you carry out a shaving on a rectum, the rectum is very likely it won't function less or worse than prior to the surgery. So you, you will never uh, impair the functional outcomes of, uh, of the patient, the function of the patients. If the patient is constipated, maybe she has a higher risk to be constipated after the surgery um, compared with another, another technique. And you have also know that the risk of recurrence is probably higher after shaving. In our series, about eight to 10%. That's why we propose the shaving in the majority of cases in elderly women with short time until the menopause, so with the short time at risk of recurrence, and particularly in women who accept to take a pill in order to induce an amenorrhea and to avoid the recurrence. However, my overall feeling about the shaving that is that it's an excellent technique when it is feasible and it should be used as a first line technique due to the low risk of complications. The disc excision. Disc excision honestly is the technique I prefer. It means that once the shaving was done, the area of the rectum 
involved by the shaving will be removed without removing the wall rectum. So this excision, very, very limited excision to the involvement of the bowel can be done with scissors or with uh, transanal staplers. And the goal is to, to carry out a complete excision of the area involved by the nodule and to conserve the bowel, meaning to, to, to conserve the posterior, the posterior face of the rectum and the mesorectum. The advantages of this technique is the, that you never denervate the rectum because the mesorectum is, uh, is conserved. And there are not large variation in the length and the volume of the bowel because there is not a segment which is cut away. However, however, when we carry out a disc excision, you may leave some microscopic foci on the edges of the excision in 27 to 44 per percent of cases. So the risk of recurrences might be, may be lower than after shaving, but higher than after colorectal resection. The suture may be very challenging to be done deep into the pelvis in laparoscopy. So that's why we, we routinely use the transanal stapler to carry out the disc excision. Meaning that we carry out the shaving and then the area of shaving, we push it inside a transanal stapler, which is placed into the rectum to reject patches like this. But the big advantage of the disc excision is related to the functional outcomes. As the mesorectum is conservated and as the, the length of the rectum does not vary, we have a good improvement of, uh, of the functional outcomes and, and we have a very low risk of low anterior rectal, uh, rectal resection syndrome. And far from all, we have no risk of stenosis, meaning that the, the suture, the semicircular suture left on the rectum will never lead to stenosis. Never, it means in more than 300 cases I have uh, done uh, until today. And my experience with this excision is, uh, is significant because uh, to date, I have managed more than 300 patients with, uh, with uh, disc excision and with nodule as large as this one, or this one, or this one. And to do this, we use two techniques. The technique employing a semicircular stapler, we call it the Ruon technique. I have managed 88 cases using this technique and it is suitable for low rectal endometriosis nodule like this one or this one or this one. And then the second, the second technique, which is used uh, uh, worldwide by several, uh, several teams, employs the transanal circular staplers like this one. These staplers are routinely employed to carry out the colorectal resection, colorectal anastomosis. And we converted this stapler to the disc excision because we do not push all the rectum into the stapler, but only the area of the, of the rectal involved by the nodule. So we can remove large patches like this until six or seven centimeter. While the suture uh, concerns regards only the anterior rectal wall. And here you have the, the technique of the uh, disc excision using the circular stapler, where the first step is performing the shaving. Here we perform the shaving. So here is the anterior rectal wall involved by the disease. So we decrease the, the, the thickness of the rectal wall once the nodule was, uh, was removed. And then at the end, we call the colorectal surgeon, which, we, which will use 
we'll push the circular stapler. Here is the shoulder, here is an anvil. We'll push, I will put a, a stitch into the shaved area. Then I will push the stitch downward. My colleague, colorectal surgeon, between the legs of the patient will push upward the circular stapler and he will close it gently. And you can see that the wall shaved area will disappear into the stapler while the posterior rectal wall will be conservated. So with technique like this, we can remove rectal patches large up to five centimeter. But as I told you, the, the, the technique of disc excision requires a prior, a previous shaving. So we start by carrying out the shaving. And once we remove the nodule, we'll uh, remove with the circular stapler, the shaved area. And this is the second technique, the Rouen technique using a semicircular stapler. This is the big nodule. You see here, it is very stenotic. The patient was very painful. Here is the nodule. We start the same, the same approach by carrying out a shaving. We'll cut the nodule and we'll remove the nodule and we leave just uh, the infiltration of the rectal wall, which is huge. And we have to decrease this infiltration by, uh, by a deep shaving and then once, once the, um, uh, the nodule was uh, removed, the shaved area will be removed by a transcendental route with this semicircular stapler. And we remove a patch until six centimeter, six or seven centimeter in diameter. And this is the vaginal infiltration. So you can see we have two disc excision techniques, which allows us to remove large, very large nodule of the low and mid rectum and upper rectum, of course. And now the last technique is the colorectal segmental resection, which means that we'll cut a segment of the rectum and we preserve, we, we, we prefer to reserve this technique to cases where we have a huge subocclusive nodules like this one nodule responsible for a long bowel infiltration. When the infiltration of the bowel is over four centimeter, like here, it's very difficult to carry out a, a disc excision because it's, it is too long. We cannot push a such long area into the circular stapler. Or when we have two nodules very close, multiple nodules very close. And in this case, we remove a segment of the rectum as short as we can. And with this technique, we have a very low recurrences rate, around one to 2%. But, but we may have the stenosis of the correct anastomosis, meaning that in endometriosis patients, if we carry out a, a anastomosis of the edges of the proximal colon and the distal rectum, we may expect a stenosis, symptomatic stenosis in 10 and even 18% of cases, which requires several endoscopic procedure to deal to dilate the, uh, the circular uh, anastomosis. And you do not have to, to think, to, to believe that if you carry out a colorectal resection, the, your resection will be microscopically complete because we demonstrated that um, microscopic foci may be found far from the, from the nodule until three or four centimeter, meaning that if you cut one to two centimeter close to the nodule, uh, you may have a residual microscopic foci on the bowel in uh, 10 or 20% of cases. Now, when we have two nodules, which are not very close, meaning they have seven to eight centimeter between them. And one of the nodules involved the mid and low rectum. We always try to spare the healthy rectum or healthy colon located between the two nodules. So we perform a disc excision on the lower nodule 
and the segmental resection on the upper nodule in order to improve the functional outcomes and to avoid long and low colorectal resection, which are very risky from uh, a functional point of view. Now, immediate complications related to colorectal endometriosis surgery. You, you never have to start a surgery in a patient with colorectal endometriosis if you are not aware about the complications you may have, you may have, and you are not able to manage them immediately and completely. And as you know, the most the most uh, terrible complication. Uh, after the, the surgery of colorectal endometriosis is the bowel fistula, meaning that you carried out the shaving or you performed the suture of the rectum and several days after the surgery, this suture will, uh, will leak, there will be a leakage and or the shaved area will uh, have a necrosis and uh, the stools will go outside the bowel, either into the abdomen or through the vagina. And this is a paper which will be available on open access. So you can, you can read it because I, I paid the open access. It will be published in uh, Human Reproduction. And uh, this is a series of 1,102 cases of rectosigmoid surgery performed in Rouen, where I was professor uh, for several years in a clinic in Rouen where I have a very good, very good fellow, a very good surgeon, and in Bordeaux where I'm right now. And in 1,102 cases, we had 37 bowel fistula, meaning 3.4%. Two thirds of them were rectovaginal fistula, meaning that the rectum was in communication with the vagina, and uh, uh, one third were the leakages with no vaginal wound. So the rate of fistula, 3.4%. And we identified that the major risk factor for the bowel fistula after the surgery is performing a bowel suture. Meaning that if you, if you choose to carry out a surgery employing either disc excision or segmental resection instead of shaving, you increase the risk of fistula five to six fold. And if you perform the, the double, double disc excision and colon resection for multiple localization, reasonably you accumulate the risk of fistula and you increase when, when uh, um, compared to shaving 10 times. So the, the technique on the rectum should be uh, chosen also, um, also uh, thinking about the, um, the risk of fistula. The rectal general fistula can be repaired, of course. However, if the vagina and the rectum are in communication, the repair is very difficult because our patients could be repaired after one procedure in only a half of cases. And one patient also needed four successive surgeries to have a complete healing of the rectovaginal fistula, meaning that the rectovaginal fistula is difficult to repair. And once the stoma is placed due to the fistula, the patients will keep it 10 months on average until the fistula will be repaired. This is different for the bowel leakage, meaning when you do not open the vagina, when, we, when the stools go into the abdomen. The bowel leakage is always a severe complications because the patients will, should be managed for peritonitis, fecal peritonitis. But after the surgery in emergency and the creation of the stoma, the large majority of them will Hill will have a bowel healing only due to, due to stoma. And only 15% of them will require a second surgery, which is much less than the patient with uh, rectovaginal fistula. And this patient with bowel leakage will keep their stoma on average five months, which is a half of the time 
of period of time required by the uh, by the repair of the rectovaginal fistula. So bowel leakage is easier to repair and there is a significantly shorter period of stoma. <clears throat> now, the question is, could stoma prevent the fistula? Should we carry out a systematic stoma in order to reduce the risk of fistula? So this is the paper uh, which is in, uh, in review in the British uh, Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. So it is far from being accepted, but I can give you the results. So here we have, we picked up from 1,100 patients with rectosigmoid endometriosis. We, keep, we picked up 363 patients who had both rectal excision and vaginal excision meaning that we created the favorable conditions to have a rectovaginal fistula. And as our policy of using fistula was, uh, had varied between Rouen, where we, ca we are carried out, uh, carrying out uh, frequently the stoma, and Bordeaux, where we dramatically reduced the, the use of stoma, we could compare uh, the risk of fistula with and without stoma. And we observed that the unique risk factor of rectovaginal fistula when both vagina and rectum are open is the high of the colorectal anastomosis. Meaning that if, if the nodule is located up to eight centimeter above the, the annulus, meaning the low rectum, the mid rectum, the risk of rectovaginal fistula increases three, threefold uh, when compared to the situation where the nodule is, uh, is uh, high. And our results are very comparable to those published uh, by other colleagues because uh, there was uh, in the French survey, French survey in 2015, in 1,135 patients, we observed a significant difference between the risk of fistula after shaving and that of disc excision and colorectal resection. And you have to keep on mind that if you perform the disc excision instead of colorectal resection, it is not to reduce the risk of fistula because the risk of fistula is very similar. We have a, we have a bowel suture, it may leak. So we reduce only the functional outcomes and you will see this. Uh, just after the, after uh, this chapter. And uh, it has been also demonstrated that the segmental colorectal resection is related to the higher risk of overall complications, clavian and freebie complications, meaning complications requiring a second surgery when comparing to disc excision and to shaving. Now, Let's speak about the functional outcomes because we may have immediate complications such as fistula and we can repair. So one year later, the patient is okay and this is past history. The functional outcomes following the rectal surgery are much more tricky because there are complications, delayed complications and persistent constant complication during the time. And they are much more embarrassing than an immediate complication. So you have to know that if you perform a segmental resection, particularly on the mid and low rectum, you have some functional complications which may occur. You can denervate the rectum, meaning that you cut the mesocolon and the splanchnic nerves and your rectum, your residual rectum will, will not function normally. There will be a stenosis of the correct anastomosis. You perform the correct anastomosis and the, the, the correct anastomosis will become more and more narrow until disappearing. There will be a reduction of rectal reservoir because the rectum is a very particular, uh, particular uh, organ where the stools are, uh, are um, retained between two defecations. If you reduce this rectal reservoir, the patients have to void the rectum every two hours, every three hours. So we have very frequent bowel movements and urgencies. And there is also a risk of fecal incontinence and urgency. And this is very, very challenging. 
Here is the Danish experience in Aarhus, meaning the university where I'm honorary professor. And this is a, a study of my colleagues from Aarhus where they use the LARS score. LARS score is the low anterior resection syndrome score. And they try to, to, to see if using this quality of life score, the patients are improved after the surgery when compared to before the surgery from a functional point of view. And they were surprised to see that patients with severe symptoms, digestive symptoms, rectal symptoms before the surgery, their percentage was very comparable to the patients who had significant uh, troubles of uh, digestive troubles after the surgery, uh, once the endometriosis was gone. And they concluded that the colorectal, when you perform a colorectal resection, you should, no, you should not tell to the patients that it is sure that the symptoms, digestive symptoms, symptoms will be relieved. You can tell her that she will have less pain, she will have uh, better sexual intercourses, but it is not sure that the digestive symptoms will be improved because the digestive symptoms related to the disease may be replaced by digestive symptoms related to the surgery you perform. We tried to, to assess whether or not the patients with disc excision of the low rectum have the same functional outcomes when compared to, uh, to patients uh, with colorectal resection of the low rectum, meaning that if we perform a disc excision of the low rectum, we can expect better functional outcomes. <clears throat> and this is a, a series of patients of the low or with low rectal endometriosis managed by the Rouen technique, meaning by very large disc excision of the low rectum. One of patients was managed, I managed her in, uh, in Aureus, and we observed that 14% of them uh, were presenting with severe bowel trouble after the surgery, one year after the surgery, and which is less than 46% in, uh, in the Aureus uh, Syria. And uh, we, 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 can, we can expect that maybe the disc excision works better from a functional point of view than uh, the segmental resection. And it is to, to, to definitively solve this, uh, answer this question that I carried out a randomized trial, endo-randomized trial, which is in open access in human reproduction. We are 60 patients with rectal endometriosis were randomized between radical procedure, meaning colorectal resection, and conservative approach, meaning shaving or disc excision. So this patient had a shaving, this patient had the disc excision, this patient had a colorectal resection. And we checked the functional outcomes two years after the surgery. And I was very surprised to see that the differences between the functional outcomes following the radical surgery and the conservative surgery were very comparable. So I could not provide with this randomized trial that disc excision and shaving actually works better from a functional point of view than the colorectal resection. But I observed that there is a significant risk of bowel stenosis after colorectal resection. So this is a negative point for the colorectal resection. And also, I think that these differences are not relevant because I enrolled not only low rectal nodule, but also high rectal nodule where the colorectal resection works alike than the disc excision, meaning that my population was maybe not the best to, to prove this difference on the low rectum. But this randomized trial has a merit to show that the conservative surgery is feasible in 90% of cases, and that the 
follow-up, the follow-up demonstrated that the results, the improvement, the significant improvement in bowel movements and pain is constant during the five, during five years after the surgery, because we have recently published the five-year follow-up and we, we prepare, we are preparing the seven-year follow-up. And we recorded only one recurrence five years after the surgery in 60 patients, meaning that the recurrence risk is very low, about 1.3% after the colorectal surgery, five years after the procedure. And we also show that women with colorectal surgery have a very good pregnancy, postoperative pregnancy rate, 80%, 75% pregnancy rate in infertile women who had surgery, meaning that the surgery is a very good treatment for patients with pregnancy intention and colorectal, and colorectal endometriosis. A majority of pregnancies were natural conceptions. So I am not, I do not agree the approach, the policy of sending all the patients with colorectal endometriosis and pregnancy intention directly to the IVF. I think it's a wrong way to treat this patient. Now, how about the recurrence risk? Because I told you that the excision of microscopic foci is less, is, is very, very less likely with shaving. Uh, it is incomplete in 40% of cases with this excision. But also in patients with colorectal resection, you may leave in 15 to 13% of cases, you may leave microscopic foci outside the segment you remove. So the goal of the colorectal surgery, colorectal endometriosis surgery, is not to hunt the microscopic foci, but to remove the macroscopic lesions which are responsible for, um, for uh, symptoms in order to preserve as much as possible the length of the rectum and the colon and to prevent the uh, functional, uh, unfavorable functional outcomes. Now, the conclusion of this presentation is that the surgery of endometriosis is a new specialty and the surgery of colorectal endometriosis is also a new subspecialty. The patients undergoing surgery for colorectal endometriosis are young. So the functional outcomes will, be, will impair or improve their life within 50 to 60 years after the surgery. So the quality of life should be a major point, uh, a major argument to choose a surgical uh, a technique uh, and, a, and a surgical management. The conservative rectal surgery is feasible in a majority of cases. You saw several pictures with very large nodules, which could be removed by disc excision. Immediate complications risk is related to the rectal suture. And it is not completely prevented by the stoma. The functional outcomes are probably improved after conservative approach in low and mid rectum, even though my randomized trial, my randomized trial enrolling patients with overall rectal, rectal uh, lesions did not prove it. But anyway, there is no demonstrated benefit related to systematic radical surgery. And in my opinion, a surgeon who carry out 80% of procedure in radical surgery in colorectal endometriosis, meaning that a, a surgeon reporting 80% of colorectal resection in 80% of patients with colorectal endometriosis, in my opinion, it's too much. While the balanced use of free techniques uh, uh, shows that uh, the surgeon try to choose the best technique in each case. So it's, it's a custom made management. And now I think you, you must know uh, this uh, author, uh, Siddhartha Mukherjee, I, I, I hope my pronunciation is, uh, is correct. 
he wrote and he's a hematologist and he wrote an excellent uh, excellent uh, book about the cancer and there is a sentence which is which I, I liked it too very much he said that the surgeons who had so painstakingly created the world of radical surgery had no incentive to change it meaning that the surgeons who have always carried out colorectal resection and they do it very, very well, uh, have not the motivation to, to do anything else. This statement, the statement of the author concerns the Hallstatt school impact on breast cancer surgery. And I think it depends on us that the deep endometriosis surgery does not follow the same path with too much radical surgery. And um, I will finish by inviting you to the Indian workshop in Bordeaux. I, I suppose you are not aware, but with, uh, with Dr. Sandeshkad, we organized an Indian workshop with five to six uh, surgeons during four days in Bordeaux with a lot of surgery. And uh, the first one was planned uh, from 9 to 12 March, but due to the lockdown, uh, it was canceled. But as soon as possible, we'll start again. And um, it, is, uh, it, will be a very, it will be a very pleasant uh, moment, uh, occasion to exchange about the correct endometriosis. And also, I invite you to have a look at my uh, um, LinkedIn uh, account and the YouTube uh, channel where I used to put every week uh, full-time surgeries commented in English uh, in uh, correct endometriosis or uh, endometriosis of sacral root. So you're very, you're very, uh, I invite you to have a look at this. So thank you very much for your kind invitation and uh, uh, I hope uh, you have uh, questions about this very, very exciting topic. Thank you, uh, Dr. Morris. It was a wonderful lecture and we have gone through all your presentation, but this was the best. And really you have shown a lot of studies and uh, the amount of work with your experience is amazing, especially in the row, low rectosigmoid the middle and the whole all the rectal surgeries which you are done showed the shaving the disc excision and the uh, uh, colo rectal removal of this endometriosis and it's really amazing that we are very happy and today proud to see you here we got many many viewers who have seen you in AGL and now it's lockdown period still in india going on I'm already busy with your patients there. So wonderful presentation, sir. I want to ask you one question. How is the unlocking of the lockdown which is happening at your place? As I conversed with you today afternoon, you were still busy in your consultation. So you yeah. can show some, throw some light on it. So we 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 started uh, we started again the surgery the the the, the surgery as usual um, one month and a half ago. So um, we are in in a normal normal program normal uh, as as usual. So uh, I have two to three uh, operative days a week, and uh, we we schedule the patient as uh, as usual. That's good. So I hope we also join soon. And I'm very happy that uh, uh, we will also do a workshop with you, TOG, and uh, we would try to connect with you soon. And I'm sure we will have many delegates who will join with a video online course coming up for endometriosis. And it would be a great effort that you would also join with us, guide us, and surely we will take on this Pan India. And uh, on this side of the continent. So thank you. We will come back to you soon and we will start with our case discussion. So may I now request Dr. Bhaskar Pal, please, you can go ahead with the case discussion now. Thank you so much.
Shimon, you'll share the screen. Niranjan, you are starting or you want me to start? Yeah, yeah, you have to read. It's your case and you can just All right. go ahead. This is a 38 year old Paris woman who underwent laparoscopic supracervical hysterectomy and sacrocervicopexy, secondary to grade 3 symptomatic apical prolapse, one year back. Earlier, she was admitted with chronic pelvic pain that had started six months following the surgery. On vaginal examination, deep vaginal examination was painful. A transvaginal sonography revealed an area with hypervascularization of the sacral property. She was scheduled for a diagnostic laparoscopy and on laparoscopy, a two by two centimeter solid wine colored hypervascular hemorrhagic lesion was seen on the sacral property. Next slide, please, Shriman. You want me to answer what would be the management approach? Yes, yes. So essentially for this patient, this is uh, an endometriotic looks like it is an endometriotic nodule which has formed at the site of her uh, fixation of the uh, cervicopexy and on the sacrum. And essentially, there are two ways of managing it. One is a medical management and one is a surgical management. Unfortunately, medical management of a scar endometriosis is, all, is always suboptimal. And it is essentially an excision of the scar endometriosis which would uh, be required to alleviate her symptoms. I really do not believe in uh, diagnostic laparoscopy. I do not think a diagnostic laparoscopy should be done if I'm not capable of uh, taking care of the pathology at the same point. So essentially, to answer the first part of the question, if I was doing a laparoscopy, I would excise the nodule at the same time. Uh, we need to be careful because it is uh, likely to be vascular, but it is a complete uh, wide excision of the nodule is what we would recommend. If, however, is coming to the second part of the question, if the patient wants to defer the surgery, or uh, we are not doing a laparoscopy when it is the, during a lockdown period, then we can buy some time with a medical management. And essentially, there are two kinds of medical management. I have used temporarily Dynogest for uh, uh, scar endometriosis. With Dynogest, uh, there is minimal effect on the size of the lesion but the patient tends to get a reasonable pain relief for the time that she's uh, buying out. Uh, whereas we've used GNRH analog, with GNRH analog, sometimes we can get rid of small nodules, but some, the nodule would inevitably come back once we stop the medical management. So yes, we can buy some time with GNRH analogs or Dynogest, but the essential uh, treatment would be a laparoscopy and excision. Uh, Dr. Roman, would you like to give your comments, please? Uh, well, in, in this case, uh, the patient is 32. Uh, my, my question is how the deep endometri how the endometriosis lesion uh, could uh, could reach this. I, I understand that she's, is a level of the promontory. Yeah, is, there, is that at the surgery she had a supracervical hysterectomy and the cervix was fixed to the promontory, and I'm sure there was some endometriosis somewhere which was missed. Yes, but endometriosis is on the promontory is or is on the deep on the rectal it's on the, vagina. It's, it's on the promontory. That's very strange because honestly, I no. have never I have never seen I agree. I agree. endometriosis lesions there. And uh, to carry out the sacrocolpopex, you have to dissect the promontory. So I'm sure that the nodule was not there when the surgery was done. Yes, yes. So I wonder if uh, she could have a kind of... Uh, of ectopic, uh, ectopic myoma or something like this, uh, because I, I suppose that the uterus was morselated. There was a morselation of the uterus. Yes, so it would be because it was supracervical. Yeah. So honestly, I would, I would do a laparoscopic uh, surgery to excise, uh, to excise this lesion. Okay, sir, uh, do you believe in, uh, Horace, sir, do you believe in medical management preoperatively in such cases or would you directly take them for laparoscopic surgery? Well, I always, I always uh, ask to patients to consider a medical treatment at least one month be before the surgery 
in order to reduce the inflammation. Because when the, when the tissues are very inflammatory, there is a small continuous bleeding, which is very embarrassing in laparoscopy. <clears throat> so uh, I asked them to take a continuous pill, whatever pill they wish. But I think it's a, it's a, it's a good point. And then after the surgery, I asked them to keep a continuous pill one to two months in order to avoid periods uh, and to avoid that the menstrual blood comes immediately on our uh, surgical excision sites uh, immediately after the surgery. Because in my opinion, it could increase the risk of, uh, of recurrence. So usually when I carry out a surgery, I ask to patients to take three months uh, continuous pill. So in this case, uh, in this case, yes, maybe I would ask her to take one month, uh, one month pill be before the surgery. So but this I think case, that the surgery is yeah. required. Uh, as, you, as you said that this case is very unusual. So you really cannot make a diagnosis of endometriosis. No. So the approach is the laparoscopic approach is the right approach. You do a laparoscopy to see what it is and whatever it is, it needs to be excised. Yeah, I, I excise because it is painful. So she, she is painful due to this lesion and we can excite. And I think it is, it's a very recent lesion. I am almost sure that this lesion was not there at the moment yeah. of the sacral colpopexy. Thank you. Uh, this, this is a very uh, tricky uh, case presentation presented by Dr. Baskarpal. And I really appreciate the way you have gone and explained our viewers and it's absolutely very rare. I agree with that. But here in India, we get such rare cases and that's what I wanted to go and explain and tell all of you something out of the box. So today we are all thinking, today the whole webinar is something out of the box. We want it to be different. We just want it to be enigmatic. It's an enigma which endometriosis, which we see routinely, but now we are seeing in bladder, we are seeing in the rectovaginal plate, we are seeing in rectosigmoid area, we are seeing in sacral promontory. Obviously, there are other areas and organs which we see in appendix and cecum, but obviously that goes towards the surgeon, but I'm sure. And nowadays, we don't just see endometriosis in a young girl or a woman who is in reproductive age, but I've seen that a woman who has got two or three children, after that, they are in 35, 40 years of age, they still land up with endometriosis. I don't know why, but it surely is a very enigmatic disease. So thank you both of you for a wonderful explanation. Now I request Dr. Garima uh, from Ames to discuss her case. Dr. Garima, can you hear us? Yes, very well. Yes, madam. Uh, please, can you please... Uh, Focus. Focus on your uh, video. It okay. is facing the other way, other way side. If you can focus it on the other side, it would be better. Madam, you are facing, your camera is facing your the dog. other side. Please correct your, uh, please correct your video. Dr. Garima, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Madam, but your camera is facing the we can't opposite see you. side. Can you see me now? No, you will have to change the video. You will have to change the camera. The camera is facing. It is. It is not the. It is not the front camera. It is the back camera. Probably that's what I think. So, if I'm not wrong, Oscar. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Karima, can you start reading the case in the meantime? We can stop your video, Dr. Garima. Yeah. Okay, I will start the case. Yes, madam. So this is a 24-year-old unmarried patient with severe dysmenorrhea. Yes. And postmenstrual spotting since five, six months. 
the menstrual pain has progressively increased over the year over the months and the pain is especially severe around the time of her periods to the extent that she cannot concentrate on her work and daily activities that is uh, it is severe enough to hamper her activities she has tried numerous painkillers and cocs without much relief she is getting married within a year though plan to have child only after 2 years and ultrasound there is bulky ovaries with slightly adherent to the uterus in the fundal region with 2 into 3 cm chocolate cyst in right endometrium with ground glass appearance and pelvic peritoneum causing adhesions with the surrounding bowel likely suggestive of peritoneal seeding mri is suggestive of findings which are consistent with deep pelvic endometriosis with peritoneal thickening with multiple loculated hemorrhagic and non hemorrhagic collections and also a 2 to 3 cm endometrioma and endometriosis is also seen along the serosal surface of the anterior rectum and posterior superior wall of the urinary bladder suggestive of pelvic endometriosis and also involving rectal wall and bladder yes uh, so uh how will you manage how... this patient madam yeah so she is a 24 years old girl she is unmarried so the fertility is not the concern immediately but she plans to get married and then uh, she may want to have children so she is suffering from chronic pelvic pain which is hampering her daily activities so we have to target this is one patient where we have to target the pain control in this type of patients so here uh, surgery for deep pelvic uh, endometriosis is a standard and we should do it but this is one patient i would like to go with medical management first okay madam and, uh, so, if so is, what is your experience and what will be the dosage of these drugs can you explain on that yeah so the patient says she has already had analgesics and uh, oral contraceptive pills she can now be put on uh, either dynogest basically uh, dynogest is a progesterone uh, progesterone and can be given in the dosage of 2 mg per day and we have given it from 6 months till um, uh, we have given it for 2 uh, years also in some patients but on an average for one year patient has taken it the problem is that dynogest is a very good drug but for when we are giving it for a longer period of time we have to make sure that fertility is not an immediate concern but the pain relief in such patients is very good and uh, the patients who are taking dynogest they are uh, uh, their response is uh, also very uh, you know prompt and uh, the other drug cabercolin is a new uh, drug and uh, it has not been yet uh, recommended for uh, endometriosis but there have been trials which has shown that it is an effective drug endometriosis we know that it is an uh, uh, estrogen dependent disorder but now it has been uh, thought that it is a disorder which has a basis in angiogenesis so whatever the implants are there in the peritoneum and on the ovary on the rectum these all endometriotic implants they require blood supply for their uh, you know existence or survival so cabergolin is a dopamine agonist which blocks or is an anti angiogenic drug so which blocks this new formation of capillaries and which hampers the blood supply to these implants and causes a sort of medical uh, uh, you know removal or uh, of the implant and uh, i have done one uh, study uh, wherein uh, i have given uh, cabergolin for 4 uh, months in patients with endometriosis where they had endometrioma of less than 5 cm on ultrasound and uh, there was a good effect on uh, pain relief almost 60% of patients had more than uh, 70% 75% reduction in the vas score and almost all patients with severe and moderate vas scores became uh, either zero or mild symptoms so cabergolin can be given in the doses of 0.5 mg weekly 
and for four months it can be easily given in patients with endometriosis. But yes, for this yes. patient, we can give Dinogis, and uh, uh, because we want to also reduce the uh, a prompt action and a standard drug. Yes, madam, I would like to share your uh, study of uh, Hamid, which was done in yeah. Arch Gynecol Obstet of 2014, where yeah. he did an RCT on 140 patients. And yes. uh, amazingly, he found that cabergolin, when it was given, it decreased the endometrioma size by 25%. So as you said, it was 0 0.5 milligram twice a week, and it was given for 12 weeks. And there was another arm of LHRH, three inch per month, and they were given in 69 patients on this arm, and the other arm, they had 71 patients. So the effect which was seen was a reduction in the size of endometrioma, and obviously there were uh, not so severe side effects, and uh, the success of cabergolin controlling endometrioma was apparently due to the diminished VEGF, thus dealing with the main pathophysiology of endometriosis spread. And uh, I would like to reiterate here the FOXI GCPR guidelines, especially on the recommendations of endometriosis management, and they have given a list of all those drugs where Dinogest is also added and Cabergolin is also there. And obviously there are various other studies which have also been coming from the various international journal. Uh, Dr. Horace, I would like to have your opinion on this. Uh, before we go ahead and treat that uh, pelvic endometriosis or the uh, endometriosis which is at the cecum and the appendix which was described in this case, but I would like your expert comments on this. Here I would like, here I would like to add one thing more. Yes, madam. Uh, as you said uh, about the side effects, that there was no side effects with cabergolin. Cabergolin we know have we have been using in hyperprolactinemia for a longer period of time, so it is a very uh, safe drug. But it has one advantage that it does not cause ovarian suppression. Oh, so okay, this is okay. one drug. This is one drug with huge advantage in treating patients with endometriosis since it does not cause ovarian suppression. So these this drug can be given as an adjunct to ART in patients with uh, endometriosis. Amazing. Oh. I think this, this point is something new. Dr. Garima from Ames, New Delhi, you're doing this study, and I'm sure you will publish it in few months' time with your results. But there are various studies which have come of cabergolin, which is angio, anti-angiogenesis, and it regresses the active lesion and does not allow the cell proliferation and it also decreases the angiogenic factors and nicely you have explained. I come back to Dr. Horace. Dr. Horace, your special comments on this. So we have a 24 year woman. She has developed this endometriosis within 10 years. Okay, because the first periods, she had first periods 10 years ago and she has 26 years until the menopausis. And after 10 years, she has developed a very, very severe disease with involvement of the bladder, of the rectum, of the ovaries. And she is very painful. So I completely agree that she can be, uh, she can be improved with medical treatment. However, the endometriosis lesions will be frozen as they are. So we'll just postpone the, 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 the surgery for uh, several years, which may be significant and relevant. Now, if she, let's say that the medical treatment works perfectly and all the symptoms are relieved. What we'll do within two years when she will intend to get pregnant? We have to refer her for IVF because we cannot expect reasonably to have a natural conception. So that's why in my opinion, the surgery is required in this kind of patients because it is the, the time to the menopause is too long to may reasonably expect to, to, to be efficient with only a medical treatment. And as she's, 
she intend to get pregnant, we can give her a chance to be pregnant naturally after the surgery. So in okay, this okay. case, immediately medical treatment, but I, we, I will prepare, I would prepare her for a surgery. Yes, absolutely. I agree. We have got two schools of thought. One is a medical line of treatment. One is a surgical line of treatment. But if she's a young girl, Bhaskar, you want to say something? Yeah, I, I don't think that medical and surgical treatment are uh, in any way uh, competing against each other. I okay. think what That's we are going to do, I think, I think what we are going to do is that at the present moment, I think there's a worldwide consensus that uh, your first laparoscopic surgery should be your best. And it has to be done by somebody who is used to doing laparoscopic surgeries rather than do a diagnostic laparoscopy and nibble at the endometriosis. That's point number one. Point number two, that since we know that uh, it is common for women with endometriosis to require multiple surgeries, it makes sense to delay the first one as long as possible. Now, this girl has got uh, endometrioma, which is reasonably small. And what is interesting is she plans to start a family in around two years time. So I will give her a medical treatment uh, because we have things like Dynogest available. I don't personally have much experience of cabagolin, but uh, we'll give a Dynogest and the Dynogest is successful in managing her um, pain. I would continue her on Dynogest till such time uh, that she plans a pregnancy and defer the laparoscopy to, to till then, which is one and a half to two years. Uh, that would be what is possibly my approach. And um, otherwise, uh, if the dinogest doesn't control her pain, then I would uh, do the laparoscopy sooner. Or if the endometrioma grows in size. Absolutely uh, amazing answers. And we are very happy to have this view. And obviously, if you ask my opinion, two to three centimeter, I would not go ahead with a surgical approach presently as she is young. And I would surely would like to give her there is obviously Dynogest, Cabergolin, and surely I will be using Cabergolin in my near future practice. And I feel the research and even the latest uh, uh, the journals are saying that Dynogest is better than medroxyprogesterone acetate also. So I'm sure this alternative can be considered. Now we come back to Dr. Garima. Uh, yes. Can we have the slides? Can we have the slide which was already on? So we will just complete this case. Uh, Dr. Garima, you can just see the slide which has been displayed here. She's been marrying, she's been planning to get married. And uh, we have obviously seen all this expert comments by Dr. Roman Boris also. And uh, I think we will go to the next case now. We have done a wonderful job. So uh, Dr. Nandita Palchetkar was supposed to join with us, but there is some technical issue today I am also facing in Mumbai three to four times. We had to log in and log out. So we will go back to the first case. Uh, we will go back to the previous case now uh, of Dr. Nandita Palchetkar, Madam, till the time she joins in. Uh, Mr. Uh, Primon, please show me the exact slide of Dr. Nandita Palchetkar, Madam. So that would be better. We are still, yes. Can we have the next slide? Yes, this is the slide. So. I request uh, Dr. Horace Roman to take this charge uh, and go ahead with this. Sir, uh, she is a 28 year old infertile woman. She's been married since two years and she has a typical intense pain in hypogastric region and the right iliac fossa since seven days. And uh, she has this chronic pelvic pain for more than one year and that has, that has worsened the symptoms for the last four months. On physical examination, everything looks fine, with just some pain in the deep pelvic area of hypogastrium and the right iliac fossa. And on vaginal examination, you find that the uterus is retroverted. There is intense pain at uterine mobilization and palpation in the right lateral culti sac. And there you find a right adnexal mass, which is palpable, tender. It is five to six centimeter in size and you can surely feel separate from the uterus. The ultrasound shows that there is some small quantity of free fluid in the uterine cavity, and there is a right adnexal endometrioma measuring about five to six centimeters. So mind you, sir, she's a 28-year-old infertile patient having this chronic pelvic pain, 
and a right adnexal mass of endometrium ulcer. The case is yours. Can we have the next slide, please? So obviously we have diagnosed it. It's an ovarian endometrium ulcer. I would like you to guide us. How would you manage this case? Obviously, this is a very easy case for you when you are a surgeon dealing with the rectosigmoidal region. Well, uh, well, um, we have an infertile patient. Um, I would like to know which is the ovarian reserve in her case, uh, meaning the level of the ovarian hormone. Is, is it normal? Is it high? <laughs> Yes, uh, sir, it is uh, normal. It is not high, it's fine. Okay, very well. So uh, we have a patient which is symptomatic, but it is very likely that under the NOGEST, the symptoms will be relieved. So we have to manage the infertility. We have two, two uh, ch choice. Either we propose her, her a surgery to treat the endometriosis, to relieve the pain, and to give her the chance of the natural pregnancy. Either or we refer her for a IVF. Now we have a six centimeter endometrioma. We have to treat it without reducing the ovarian reserve, of course. So I think that in this case, we have to discuss between sclerotherapy, laparoscopic sclerotherapy, meaning that we aspirate the content and we inject alcohol for 10 to 15 minutes. The effect on the endometrioma is excellent. And after this, we can remove all the endometri uh, endometriosis lesions, which are not very, very complicated to manage. So we can relieve the pain. We can reduce, uh, making disappear the endometrioma without reducing the ovary reserve and we give her a chance of spontaneous conception. If she does not want to, to have the surgery, we have to give her dianogest and when to refer her to the IVF. For the IVF, a large cyst like this is embarrassing. So probably the, the colleague in charge of the IVF will carry out a sclerotherapy through the vaginal route and then she will have an IVF and I think she has 70% uh, of cases of chance to be pregnant. So the probability of pregnancy after the surgery and the IVF, in my opinion, is very comparable. So uh, with the difference that after the surgery, a half of pregnancies are natural, while I, after the IVF, all the, pre all the pregnancies are due to the IVF. So the choice is the choice of the patients. We have to give her to provide her all this information and she will uh, she will uh, take uh, an informed uh, choice thank you thank you dr horis now baskar would you like to do fulguration on her would you like to do cystectomy or would you use lasers what will be your approach in dealing with this endometrioma because as you wonderfully said that the first surgery which we do has to be a complete surgery and if you land up with an incomplete surgery, we find this patients coming back after two years, three years with a recurrent endometriosis. So that is very important. Oscar, your take on this, please. Yeah, I think that's a very, very difficult, very, very tricky situation. For any ovarian cyst, if you do an excision, the risk of recurrence is less, but you're going to cause substantial ovarian damage. On the other hand, if you do a fulguration, your ovarian damage will be much less, but on the other hand, your recurrence risk will be higher. So it is always a very, very tricky situation. Now, we do not have much experience of sclerotherapy, and we don't do much sclerotherapy, but I think one take-home message I want to give to viewers is that do not waste your time doing medical management when somebody comes in with endometriosis and infertility. It is either going to be a surgery or it's going to be an IVF. Uh, I think this situation becomes easier because this lady has already got pain, so if somebody has got pain, then uh, obviously a surgery would uh, help relieve her pain because uh, that is a better option to go for a surgery. Now, what surgery, if she doesn't have pain, then of course we will send her to an IVF uh, consultant first to decide whether they are happy to access the ovaries or they think that, as Dr. Roman said, that the size of the endometrioma will be an embarrassment. 
in trying to get the eggs. If this lady's AMH is normal and if this is her first surgery, I would still go with an ovarian cystectomy and then give her a chance to uh, conceive for around a short trial for three to six months. If she can't, then she should go straight for an IVF. On the other hand, if her AMH is if her AMH is compromised already, the ovarian reserve is compromised. I would want an infertility specialist to see her before I embark on a surgery. Because then there are two options. Number one, if they can try and get some eggs beforehand, or whether they want us not to cause further ovarian damage. In that case, I would be more keen to do a falguration counseling the lady properly that there is a risk of recurrence with that, but we'll do the falguration essentially from a reproductive point of view. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Bhaskar and uh, Dr. Horace. I want to tell the audience today, we are enthralled by the speaker and the discussion which has occurred today. Endometriosis is not only described in 1800s, but it has also been described as a disease as back as 1600 BC. Schron described it as a female disorder in which the ulcers appear in the abdomen, the bladder, intestine, and outside the uterus and cervix. And as I said before, it was first described by Von Rokitansky in 1860. And the most important thing I would like to tell you, Sir William Osler, he said, those who know endometriosis knows gynecology. So today we have gone through the whole gynecologic book of endometriosis, dealing with the rectosigmoid, with the appendix, with the cecum, the sacral promontory, in the ovaries. And I'm amazed by the audience interaction which we are having. I'm going to share with you wonderful questions which are there directed to each one of you. So let us start with Dr. Horace, sir. Sir, if you are there, I would like to ask you a simple question which has been described here by one of our colleagues. And she is herself a doctor. And she says that I'm 35 year old doctor. I have bilateral chocolate cyst with marked symptoms. And I have two children, a boy and a girl. The last childbirth was five years. So what is your advice now? Is it, will it be a surgical treatment with TH, with BSO, or I should go for a medical management? Sir, what is your take on this? So could, could, you, could you repeat the age of the patient? Uh, sir, she's a doctor. She's 35 year old. 35, with, okay. Yes, yes. She's already completed her childbearing age. She has a child. The last child was five years, a boy and a girl. Both of them are two children. And she has got this bilateral chocolate cyst, which is with marked symptoms. It's not going away, sir. Yeah, I, I will I will I would recommend her medical treatment first. Okay, okay, fine. Thank you. And then maybe if she doesn't come out of that, then we can go ahead with a surgical line of treatment. Sir, uh, uh, Bhaskar, can you take this question? This is uh, from Dr. Tyra. Management of dysmenorrhea due to endometriosis in a 15-year-old girl. How will you manage her pain, Bhaskar? Well, I think it will have to go step by step. We would start, it depends on, first we would we need to do an imaging. Yes, uh, we have and done. An yes, she has endometriosis in the ovary, 15 years old girl. It is about two to three centimeter being there. If, it, if she's got a two to three centimeter size uh, uh, endometriotic cyst in the ovary, I would straight away start her with Dynogest. We need to be slightly careful with Dynogest because there is, uh, although it is not like generation logs or depot provena, but some degree of bone loss does happen in adolescence. So we need to be a little careful. Whereas if this lady had a normal ultrasonography, I would have started on the oral contraceptive pill, a combined oral contraceptive pill. But if she has a Proven endometrioma, I would start her off straight away on dialysis. Uh, Dr. Karima, uh, there is a patient. Uh, she has got an endometriosis cyst. The size is not mentioned. This is a question by Dr. Uma Verma. 
can we do induction in a patient with endometriosis cyst and if she gets pregnant what are the precautions during pregnancy this is dr uma verma uh usually if the size of the endometriosis is less than 3 cm uh then definitely we can but it all depends upon how long the endometriosis is the duration of infertility and also the ovarian reserves because if the endometriosis is already set in and there is endometrioma then there are chances that the tubo ovarian uh, anatomy is distorted and just by giving an ovulation induction we may not be helping the patient and in fact we may have uh, be depleting her of her ovarian reserves so uh, i would like to have uh, all these things uh, but if since uh, the other part of the question is can we give ovulation induction yes if uh, amh is okay and she has only uh, uh, infertility of short duration and she has a small endometriosis but uh, if the endometriosis is, uh, is visible on ultrasound then we have to do at least a laparoscopy to confirm that uh, the tubes are patent and uh, the tubo ovarian uh, uh, anatomy is normal then our, after knowing all these things uh, she may go for uh, ovulation induction and uh, about uh, the, the complications in pregnancy uh these patients uh, usually don't have a very uh, uh, any specific type of complications during pregnancy but yes any patients who have uh, conceived on uh, art or having endometriosis there is slightly uh, more chance of having uh, first trimester com complications so if the first trimester complications are not there and we are able to take care of them then uh, uh, there is not uh, much uh, problem with pregnancy in these group of patients oh okay wonderful you have given a wonderful uh, explanation dr garima thank you so much for that insight and now we come back to dr horace and dr horace i want to tell you we have dr sandesh kade asking you the questions so you have your old friend being joining us and we have more than 1000 users logged in right now seeing you and the amazing panelists which have joined us sir this question is for you dr horace how will you monitor patients for immediate post operative leak after bowel surgery please elaborate on that so um usually we if when we when we carry out a colorectal uh, surgery by disc excision or uh, by uh, colorectal resection usually the patient leaves the clinic at day 3 and uh, she has to stay not far from uh, from the clinic meaning uh, in uh, in bordeaux or uh, in the region of bordeaux uh seven more days and during this day Uh, during the, the seven days, we ask her to to carry out a blood uh, sample every day, and we measure the C-reactive protein and the white cell, a uh, white blood cell. And uh, beginning with day four, the postoperative day four, the C-reactive protein should be should com continuously decrease. and it should be below 100 the patient should not have fever over 30 <clears throat> so if one of these events occurs c reactive protein which increases fever over 38 degrees celsius we measured it in celsius degree celsius we ask the patient to come back and we carry out a ct scan if the ct ct scan shows a correction a liquid uh, in the pelvis or it does not show anything we carry out the laparoscopy in emergency and we check by a bubble test the rectal suture it may happen a sunday morning doesn't matter we do it immediately if we have arguments for a leak for a leakage we carry out a stoma and then the patient will uh, will stay in the hospital three or four days and uh, then she will leave and she will come back two months later to check the healing of the of the fistula and we will remove the stoma 
So this this is the the absolutely the overall management but, management yes. but I, I invite you to have a look at the paper uh, uh, published in uh, in uh, open access in human reproduction because i discuss all this uh, all, all this follow up and also reveal that with with uh, pa patients with uh, rectal vaginal fistula usually uh, require more than one uh, procedure so then the procedure is uh, is uh, um, follows a different uh, different path depending on the evolution of the patient, but it is, uh, this is the immediate follow up. Absolutely, you have uh, nicely elaborated how you you manage a post operative uh, patient with fistula. Now there is one more question by Doctor Sandesh, and he has said that there is there are two discs. One is in low, and one is in medium uh, rectal area. So which disc would you remove first, either the lower one or the middle one, and why? Yeah, so let's say that we have a patient with a low rectal nodule and a sigmoid colon nodule. Uh, we always start by the upper one, because if we carry out a colorectal resection on the, on the nodule, uh, on the upper nodule, we have to carry out first the anastomosis. So Sir, we'll push. I would like to interrupt here. The upper nodule has to be done transanally or it has to be done laparoscopically. laparoscopically. Please it, it, it depends. It depends. If if the nodule, if the upper nodule is lower than 20 centimeters, it can be reached through a, through a transanal stapler. So we do it transanally. If the nodule is upward, we do it laparoscopically or even through a small uh, suprapubic incision. But we always start by the upper nodule. Because if you okay. start by the lower nodule, you have a suture and then you have to pull your uh, transanal stapler to reach the upper nodule through, uh, through a rectum which already has um, a suture. And this may be dangerous for the rectal suture. Okay. So the, the uh, low rectal suture is at the end. Well, thank you uh, for that wonderful answer. I would like to add here a comment by Dr. Yasni Selvaraj. And uh, he has written that I do sclerotherapy for recurrent endometriomas. And I have done for 80 patients up till now with 83% pregnancy rate. I have also presented this paper in Fertivision Division 2019 in Delhi and I got the best clinical paper award. And many of my friends in South Tamil Nadu are doing this sclerotherapy using a new sclerosing agent. This is Dr. Yasni. So I think I thought I will just uh, put this viewpoint also for recurrent endometriosis. There are various guidelines which have also come up. Uh, ASHRA guidelines are there for recurrent endometriosis. It, uh, it usually affects about six to three percent of patients who come back with uh, uh, repeat surgery. And as Dr. Baskar said, if unfortunately it's an incomplete surgery or a recurrence which occurs back again, a refilling of the endometriomas, then maybe this option could be kept in mind. Uh, and depending upon what is the patient having infertility or no. So thank you so much, all of you. There are a few more questions I would like to ask you, Dr. Garima. Uh, there is a question for you. How long Dinogest should be used for endometriosis? This is Dr. A.S.A. Adila Banu. Dr. Garima, can you hear me? For a very long period of time. So we can you Hello, can you yes, hear me? Yes, yes. The question is, it is a, a, a question by Dr. Banu. And uh, how long dinogest should be used in endometriosis? We usually give medical all the medical management options, that is, including dinogest, for say six months to the time period when uh, the patient either goes for uh, uh, fertility or fertility cannot uh, for a very long period of time. We give them for six months or one year, then give a gap of uh, three, four months. And if the patient is fine, it's okay. And if the symptoms reoccur, then according to our uh, protocol, the patient is, should go for a surgery. Okay. 
डॉक्टर बास्कर आई वॉन्ट टू कम बैक टू यू देर इज एन एटीन इयर्स ओल्ड अनमेरिड गर्ल विथ फाइव प्लस फोर पॉइंट फाइव सेंटीमीटर्स एंडोमेट्रियम विथ परसिस्टेंट एबडोमिनल पेन डॉक्टर अल्पना has been uh, you know this is the question been there dr alpana has asked you this question 18 years old unmarried girl with a fine into 4.5 cm endometrium with persistent abdominal pain how will you manage this dr baskar um endometrium which are bigger than 4 cm do not respond very well to medical management which means with medical management it is at 18 year old we will possibly give her dynogest and with dynogest it is unlikely that the cyst would go away maybe the dynogest might cause a little bit of shrinkage or it might uh, uh, not allow the cyst to increase in size uh, i think they need to be counseled well regarding medical management medical management is going to be expensive going to be long drawn and at a certain point of time she is sure to request surgery but with most 18 year olds even the parents uh, here and the patients themselves would like to have a trial of medical therapy before they go for a yes, surgery yes yes so i think because we'll once you on touch a, that endometrium a, baskar i agree with you absolutely i am interrupting you that point has to be noted because these are young girls they are not getting married early and absolutely this medical treatment will surely help them please continue baskar i'm sorry to interrupt you but yeah, i got so start off with the medical treatment i think i think start off with the medical treatment and then see review the situation and see how things go i think but it needs to be counseled that she would require a surgery at some stage i think this is very similar to the case we discussed earlier yes 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 but we I have just want to give a, i just want to give a rejoinder to uh, what garima said regarding dynogest you know the initial dynogest which reports came from europe and from japan for 6 months so initially we were using them for 6 months now we have much longer data and i have had i have got patients now who are on dynogest for 2 years and there are now data where dynogest has been safely used for up to 5 years and it's a, it's a wonderful drug for keeping patients following a surgery to as a secondary uh, prevention or also in a recurrent endometriosis yes definitely i agree with you dr pal that it is very good for recurrence and secondary prevention and we have also had patients who have been uh, using it for 2 years now uh but th that patient uh, if she's taking it for uh, she was a young girl and so if yeah. the symptoms recur then she can always have a yes, surgery otherwise if she wishes to she can continue as i said garima that when you are giving um, dynogest in adolescence uh, we need to be slightly careful because there's one only one study of dynogest in adolescence which does show a little amount of bone loss which doesn't really yes. come back so um, it is much smaller come much much less uh, profound compared to a depot metroxy progesterone acetate or a gnra analog but some degree does might happen so i am not yeah, in so favor of putting young girls on dynogest for a long period of time but for middle yes. aged or the elderly ones yes we can keep them on for longer yes yeah, so this is that group of patients where cabergolin uh, can be of uh, use once uh, it has proved its efficacy in endometriosis because it is a good drug it does not cause hypoestrogenism it does not cause any effect on bone uh, mineral density and it is very safe in young girls absolutely amazing discussion which is going on i am enthralled and we have got more than 1200 users logged in dr hores this guy is classy he is an encyclopedia of endometriosis congratulations niranjan sir and the team this comment is from dr sandesh kade sir we are very happy to see you being there and there is a question for you sir that this question is from dr rohan krishna kumar he was with me in sayan hospital and i am very proud today that he is doing independently radical surgeries is independently managing his ot along with his father dr krishna kumar this is a specific question to you sir dr roman bowel preparation prior to resection how would you do that sir please explain yeah so i ask to all the patient to have to follow um uh free residue diet residue free diet uh, for 5 days then 2 days or one day before the surgery they uh, take a clean prep in clean prep a preparation uh, they drink a preparation to clean the bowel 
and the morning of, morning of the surgery, they have an enema. And with this, we have a clean, a clean uh, colon rectum, accepted in patients with very huge stenosis and subocclusive stenosis because these patients cannot void their, uh, their rectum. So uh, we, we should handle with this. And um, as an example, I will just uh, share with you uh, a patient I uh, saw I saw some two two hours ago. Yes. So, do you see this? Yes, amazing. This is a beautiful MRI scan. So we have we have the uterus. Oh. We have we have the bowel. And here is the endometriosis. So this patient presents a subocclusion due to the huge endometriosis lesion. And obviously, this patient cannot, whatever preparation we give, we cannot void the colon, so we have to do the surgery as is. Sir, I have recorded this film, and I'm really impressed by this picture which you have shown. Sir, we have now, in India, we are facing a situation where the lockdown is still increasing in some of our states and cities. But I want to ask you, sir, they are looking at you because you have already, France has already started laparoscopic surgery, but now we are in a, such a situation where we are still getting those cases. There is a plateau now. We are hoping that these cases reduce of COVID. So there is a question by Dr. Deshmukh. He's asking, I don't know whether it's he or she, but would you please explain what would you take precautions specifically COVID in, uh, in this COVID cases uh, before you go ahead with this treatment of endometriosis? Yeah, so all, all the patients prior to come uh, two days before the surgery, they receive at home a questionnaire about the symptoms, about the contacts with patients supposed to have uh, COVID. And if uh, in the questionnaire, some one or two questions may suggest that the patient could have a contact with a patient with COVID. We ask her to carry out a test because before coming, prior to coming in the clinic. So we do not do a test to all our patients, but with to only the patients at risk. Now you have, you have to know that uh, uh, we are in Bordeaux, we are in the region with a very, very low prevalence of the COVID infection, even during the period of lockdown. So the risk to have a patient with COVID is actually very low, but we take all our, uh, we are very cautious to, to avoid. And during the last month, I canceled a surgery in a patient was likely to had uh, to had uh, contact with a patient with COVID. Well, uh, hopefully uh, we end up COVID soon as early as possible. But I'm sure uh, you are having a better time away from COVID. Uh, how many hours prior to the OT you give enema to the patient? This is the next question being asked uh, by Doctor M J Deshpok. How many? How many hours prior to the operation theater you give the enema to the patient? Uh, three to four hours. Okay. So four if hours. if the surgery is scheduled at eight o'clock, she is waked up at uh, half past four to have the enema. Oh, that's a, that that's quite early. Mm. And uh, there is a comment by Dr. Vinita. She has said very learning and update talk by all the respected speakers, Dr. Horace, Dr. Baskar, Dr. Karima. Congratulations to Dr. Niranjan. Thank you, Dr. Vinita, for that uh, uh, comment and uh, appreciation of the TOG webinars. There's uh, Dr. Reena Shrestha from Nepal. This question is what precautions to be taken during laparoscopic surgery and what kind of setup we need to do surgery in this COVID pandemic? This was a question which is very elaborate. Uh, Dr. Reena, we have got guidelines on that. Uh, there are guidelines of Eshray, there are guidelines of IAG, 
and it's a very elaborate question i will surely send you the pdf so i think we have uh, uh, wonderfully managed this uh, cases i would like each one of you to give your take home messages and then we end this webinar dr horace to begin with so my 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 message is um, is to to advise our colleague to take care to patients with uh, young patients with symptoms of endometriosis with lesions of the rectus sigmoid who intend to get pregnant uh, do not forget that the surgery is a very efficient uh, tool to relieve the pain and to help the patients to get pregnant that uh, the surgery on the colon and rectum should be uh, individu individual, should be custom made, but also the surgery of the endometriomas. So we, we discussed about sclerotherapy, laser, plasma, or uh, cystectomy. And um, that I want to, to recall you that you're always welcome in uh, Bordeaux for, uh, for several days uh, during the master classes. So you have just to contact uh, Dr. Sandeshkade to, to schedule this. And I actually enjoyed to be with you uh, this afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Horis. Dr. Baskar. Yeah, as I, as I said earlier, I think endometriosis is best managed with a combination of surgery and medical treatment. And uh, we need to be, we need to minimize the number of surgeries and make sure that the first surgery is done by somebody who's experienced in handling endometriosis. And the recurrent endometriosis or deep infiltrating endometriosis has to be done in a multidisciplinary endometriosis center. I think these are the most important messages and always manage endometriosis with infertility in conjunction with a fertility specialist. Yes, thank you. Dr. Karima. Ah, yes, everything has been so well said by the, uh, uh, everybody, by Dr. Hores, by Dr. Bhaskar. And uh, I would uh, totally agree with both of them that endometriosis is an enigmatic disease. It is a chronic debilitating disease. So even if it occurs in a young adolescent patient, we should not postpone a definitive treatment for these patients. And it is the medical or surgical are not competitive or are not effective when they are given in individually. We should always individualize the treatment and the two type modalities of treatment, they are collaborative and we should always uh, keep the interest of the patient first. Thank you so much. Wow, wonderfully, all of you have given so nice take home messages. And it's a great pleasure to have, uh, to have all of you here with us on this TOG webinar. I would like to thank all of you, especially Dr. Horace. You have been so nice that you have been here for last two hours and your lecture was mesmerizing. And I'm sure those members and users are really enthralled and mesmerized. We are going to have a video recording, which I will send you soon. I will send you within the next two days and we will be having that broadcast to you also. Thank you, Dr. Bhaskar. Thank you, Garima, and all the users who have faith in us and who are there to look at us. And we are going to come with more and more uh, programs. I would like to announce here, we are going to have Dr. Nezat, the god of endometriosis. He's going to be here soon by the end of this month. And we are going to discuss about lasers and we are going to have other luminaries from the planet Earth to guide us as we decided and we have said endometriosis is an enigmatic disease and it is going to be enigmatic and we are going to always try our best to give the best to our patients. Usually if it's a young patient, we would like to treat them medically and try to see that as far as possible, they do not land up with an endoscopic surgery, but if they land up with an endoscopic surgery, well, the surgery has to be the best and it has to be complete. And then we need to see from their point of view, fertility point of view, and that's where we do not want them to land up with recurrent endometriosis. So we had wonderful luminaries today. And I would like to tell that endometriosis is supposed to be the disease of the rich. And it has happened to many of those people in Bollywood and in Hollywood. I would not like to name them 
but surely we want our girls and our young women not to suffer much more and to get them diagnosed early and give the best treatment so with this i would like to end the webinar and thank you all of you to be there with us shabha khair shubh ratri namaskar vadakkam and see you soon take care be safe thank you very much thank you thank you doctors thank you for your time thank you so much see you soon sir thank you garima thank you thank you sir yeah wonderful time to uh, have with you we will see you offline okay sir thank you thank Bye. you sir it was it was my thank you thank you garima madam thank you sir thank you niranjan sir see you thank soon thank you madam thank you madam okay bye bye thank you window for the camera